A number of people on the Reddit Benita forum have been connecting various things to their 6522s in their 6502 based computer projects, and I wanted to try to join some dots maybe around how some of those things can be connected. If you've been following along Ben's vi videos, then you will have connected a 6522 to a 6502 based computer system, and you will have an LCD display that's connected up to the 6522, something like this. I think Ben puts his over there, but you know it's connected to the same same wires there. When you apply the power, you you have a Hello World program that prints out Hello World. If you look at Ben's website, he also shows connecting five buttons up to the lower pins of the 6522 here. So I've gone ahead and done that uh, following the circuit diagram on his website. What I wanted to talk about was the fact that once you've done this, you've actually now pretty much run out of pins on the 6522. So I wanted to talk about how you can avoid using up all of the pins with just these two devices um, using a technique called multiplexing without really any downside on the software side. It's slightly more complexity on the hardware side, but not very much. So the most important thing to start off with is to note that the way, the way Ben has the LCD display connected up to the 6522, it has eight data lines, which I've used green for here, uh, and three control lines, which I've used yellow for. The right-hand control line here goes to the PA7 on the 6522, and is the enable line on the LCD display. And what Ben does in the code to drive this is he sets up the value he wants on the green data lines, then he sets up the value he wants on the lower two yellow data uh, control lines, and then he toggles the enable bit on and then off again. And so long as that enable bit is not on, the LCD isn't really paying attention to what happens on any of these data lines. It's only when you turn that enable bit on that the LCD actually reads the data. Similarly, when he's reading from the LCD, all those data lines actually become inputs. And the way he does that is he sets them all up as inputs. He arranges with the lower two yellow lines here, the control lines, for the LCD to be in out outputting mode or read mode. The, so the 6502 is reading from the LCD. And then he turns on the enable pin. And at that point, the LCD starts writing to that data bus. Ben can then read the value back from the port B on the 6522 and then turn the enable line off again. So as you see, as so long as the enable line is not active, the LCD doesn't really care what's going on on any of those lines, and we can actually use them for other purposes in the meantime. One person on the Reddit forum for Ben Eater's projects uh, was trying to connect up two LCD displays, um, and again, the way to do that is simply to connect the second LCD display to all of the same data pins and the bottom two control pins, exactly the same as the first one, and just connect it to a different pin for its enable line. And then in your code, all you need to do is change the code that drives the LCD to be able to t toggle one enable line or the other one. And that way you can drive two, three more LCD displays simply by connecting to different pins. Obviously, if you look at the number of pins there are here, on port A there are eight pins, and we've used two of them for these two control lines for the LCD, so the, the maximum number there would be six. But moving beyond LCDs, there are other devices you can connect up through a 6522. Some of the ones I'm working on at the moment are sound output and, um, and SD card input, which is, uh, which is really cool, using one of these kind of extension boards. That's an SPI interface board with an SD card in it, and I'm looking to have my 6502 run code from the SD card instead of having to burn it into ROMs. Uh, and, and that I, I want to hook that up through the 6522 as well, um, and I could do that directly, but I would, again, be dedicating pins to that, but I don't want to dedicate. Then we also have these four buttons, which, which are using one pin each here, and, and, and again, that is quite wasteful. So what I want to do in this video is show, with these buttons particularly, how we can multiplex them with the LCD in an effective manner, also in an expandable manner that will allow additional devices to be connected later. So in the same way that the LCD can be in read or write mode, these, these, green, these green data lines here going into port B, they can be inputs or outputs as far as the CPU is concerned. What I want to do is allow them to be inputs from the buttons as well as being inputs from the LCD, obviously at different times. And then I should be able to just replicate this same program that, that sort of reads the buttons and prints on the screen which buttons are currently pressed, but without using all of these pins up. 
Now we can't connect the buttons straight to these pins here. Uh, there, are, there are ways you could do it through resistors, but the, the problem if you do try and connect them directly is that when the buttons are pressed, it's going to interfere with the signals going to and from the LCD. Uh, as, soon, as soon as these buttons are pressed, it actually pulls the pin straight to ground. Um, and so if the 6522 is trying to send something to the LCD while you're holding down one of those buttons, uh, the message is not going to get through. And similarly, on the return path, when the 6502 is waiting for the LCD to be ready, um, and it's reading values from the LCD to tell when it's ready, it's not going to be able to tell because the button could be holding the line low. So what we need to do is proxy those buttons through through another chip and to do that we're going to use this which is a 74HCT245 8-bit bus transceiver. If you're following any of Ben's 8-bit computer videos I think he uses these in the 8-bit computer for similar purposes. Basically it's a two-way chip uh, there are eight pins on one side which are sort of connected to eight pins on the other side in one direction at a time and one of the pins lets you choose which direction that connection works in and another pin also tells you whether it's doing the whether it's doing the connection or not so i'm going to take the buttons out now and i'm going to put the bus transceiver down here now Uh, the bus transceiver needs its power pin connected and its ground pin. Now the next eight pins along the bottom here are the are one set of the uh, eight bits that it supports. Uh, I'm going to connect those through to the buttons over here now. And I'm basically wiring up the buttons in the same way I did before. Looks good. Um, I'm going to put the resistors over here this time, it'll be a little bit easier. I'm going to use the bottom five bits of this bus transceiver for the LC, uh, for the for the buttons. I think these are 4K7 resistors, it doesn't matter much which, I think Ben had 1Ks on his diagram. Um, the bigger value you use the less current flows, but it's not a big deal either way. Of course the current flows when the button is pressed because the button connects this to ground and we are using resistors to connect to the to the positive rail here. Let's wire them across to the buttons now. I can't remember which order I put these in the code, it might be wrong but never mind, it doesn't matter much. Do left then right then maybe down then up. Squash them down out of the way a bit. So I'm also going to connect the remaining pins down here to ground and that's because I'm not connecting anything to them and they are going to be functioning as input pins. So I'm going to have all four of the remaining bits going to ground. Next, along the top row, I want to connect the corresponding pins to the data pins that that they've already been helpfully brought down over here for the LCD display. That's easy enough, just wire them across. I'm doing this one for one, so the order of the pins on the 74HCT245 is exactly the same as the order it is on the 6522. So there are two more pins to connect on, on the buffer. I'm not going to connect the last four output pins along the top there, because I'm not actually passing any data into the input corresponding input pins. If I had more buttons I'd just connect more through to the remaining data lines over here. The, the, the two remaining pins on the 74HCT245 are a direction pin that controls which direction the data flows in. Now that's, the, that's pin 1 and if that's high then the data flows from the bottom row of pins to the top row and if it's low, the data flows from the top row to the bottom row. So we want the data flowing from the bottom to the top, so I'm going to connect that high. Uh, 
And the last pin is the enable pin. Now this pin will be active low, so when this pin is high, the bus transceiver is inactive and doesn't pass any data from the bottom to the top or from the top to the bottom. All, all 16 of those pins turn into high impedance input pins, meaning that it won't interfere with the inter operation of the LCD display. When this pin is low, the top row, because of the way we set the direction pin up, the top row of pins will become outputs and it will start writing to the port B pins of the 6522. So because all the existing code currently uses the enable pin in a active high fashion, I don't really want to connect that straight to one of the pins on the 6522. I could write the code to support that, but I think it's simpler um, if we actually put an inverter in here and invert the sense of that signal. So here is an inverter. This is actually a 74AHCT04. It doesn't really matter which kind of inverter you, you use. It's just what I had. It's going to need power on ground as usual. And what I'm going to do is connect the enable pin of the 74HCT245 to one of the inverters and connect the other end of the inverter to, let's say, pin 4 of the pin 4 of port A of the 6522, which is currently an unused pin. So in Ben's code, pin 4 is actually set as an input. We're going to swap that around now, set that as an output. And now when we raise pin 4 high, the values from the buttons will get passed through onto the port B bus here, and we'll be able to read them off the, off the 6522. I'm also going to tie the unused pins low to, to avoid spurious signals and overheating and so on. But in the meantime, let's go and have a look at the code and see what we need to change to make this work. So here's the code that drives the uh, LCD and reads the buttons. My code is not quite the same as Ben Eater's, but I've tried to make it, make it as similar as possible to make this easier to follow along with. So here, for example, is the pin definition for the enable pin for the LCD, the read-write pin and the register select pin. So I'm going to add another definition down here for the bus enable pin. And that was pin 4 of port A, which is the next one down there. Next change, uh, the data direction register for port A. So in Ben's example, he only sets the top three to be output and the bottom five are all inputs. Um, as we're not going to be connecting the buttons up there anymore, I'm going to set them all to be outputs. Um, I'm not using them all at the moment, but we might as well just do that for now. Um, you can always change the bottom ones to something else. The critical one here though is to make sure that pin 4 on port A is now an output because that is now going to be the uh, enable driver for the buttons. Uh, most of the rest of this stays pretty much the same um, and the next interesting part is down here. I'm not going to go into detail about how the uh, code to read the buttons and print the messages on the screen works here. Um, a lot of it is actually using my own custom functions to do a few things, so don't worry too much about those things. Um, the key thing that I am changing here though is here where I load from port A to read the button state. I'm going to take that out completely and replace that with a call to a subroutine. So I'm going to do JSR uh, read buttons. That was previously just doing a simple load from port A. So if you have a similar arrangement where you've set the, your system up in the way Benita had it and you're reading from port A to read the button state, then this routine will basically replace that with what's required to read the buttons with multiplexing. Uh, and the, the read buttons routine itself is down here. Um, and I will now explain how that works. So to start with, um, port B in Ben's setup is by default set to be outputs. He only switches it to inputs when he's waiting for LCD results. Obviously when we want to read the buttons we need it to be set to be inputs. So the first thing we do is set the data direction register for port B to all inputs. Next, 
uh, we need to enable the buttons. So this is this is as simple as just setting the BE pin, the, bu the button enable pin on port A, and that will turn on the bus transceiver and allow the button states to be read from port A. F sorry, from port B. And the next thing we do here is actually read the button state. Now we're reading this from port B instead of port A as before, because now the buttons are connected to port B instead of port A via the transceiver. After doing that we need to do a little dance. I'm, I'm saving the A register here so that I can put it back later. That A register actually contains the button state, so that's pretty important. Uh, in the meantime, we need to uh, turn off the buttons and restore port B to being outputs before we leave this subroutine. Having done that, we pull the button state back off the stack and return. So it's pretty simple overall. The end result is the same. The A register ends up holding the current state of the buttons in the bottom four bits. I've only put four buttons in. If there were more buttons, there'd be more of the bits. Um, and then the code that was previously responding to that doesn't need any changes at all. Uh, the values are returned in exactly the same format as they were before. Again, I'm not going to go in detail about how the rest of the code works here. Uh, if you're interested in more information on that, uh, let me know in the comments and I can either make a video explaining that more or maybe upload the code to a website or something like that. So with those code changes in place, let's have a look at what happens on the actual circuit. Um, and as before, we have the 74HCT245 with the button inputs going into the lower four bits on the bottom row, uh, top four bits on the bottom row coming to the port B bus on the 6522, they're going to the bottom four pins, and the control line on the, on the 245 comes through this inverter and onto port A pin 4, which is the one that we're toggling high in the code. So when that pin goes high in the code, we're expecting the bus transceiver to activate and pass through the button states from the lower row of pins here to the upper row of pins, and that will then be, be readable through the 6522. Let's see what happens. Turn it on. So that's a good sign to start with. We're still seeing hello world, despite the fact that we've got all of this stuff hooked up. If we'd done that before, before changing the code, it wouldn't have worked because th having the bus transceiver hooked up like this would, would have been uh, interfering with the LCD output. So that's a great sign the LCD is still working. Now the code I wrote prints the hello world message as before and then it continually pulls the buttons and it only does anything further if it sees a button press. So as soon as I press a button we should see a result. So let's try left. Yep, and as you can see it says on the screen L because L is being held down and if I release left it will go blank again. I can try right, up and down. So I got them all I got the bits right in the code, that, that's that's good. And you know, we should be able to do chords as well, so left and right together, left and up and right. There's no issue here with rollover because all four of those buttons are going through four distinct pins to the 6522. But if you look back at the 6522 now, compared to what we started with, we've only used one additional pin that wasn't used before for the LCD because we've been able to reuse these data lines that the LCD was already using. And that was really the, the main point of this video, the value of multiplexing. And again, multiplexing is where you have pins like these data pins, which serve multiple functions, and you use other pins to choose what those functions are. This is obviously happening quite a lot. Uh, elsewhere in the computer. I mean, everywhere that there is a data bus which connects to multiple chips, such as your RAM, your ROM, your 6502, uh, and the 6522, these are all connected to the data bus. They all share exactly the same connections to those data bus pins, um, but it's the output enable pins on each of them which are controlling which one of them is actually allowed to use the bus at that, at, at that point. And the, where, the point where the multiplexing comes in is actually the way that your circuit is using the address lines on the 6502 to select which of those devices are active. Anyway, that, I think that's it for today. hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please like and subscribe as usual. Comment down below if you've got any questions about this. Um, if you're interested in seeing more things you can do with the 6522, I've certainly explored it quite a long way beyond these points. If you want to see how the timers work or how to use interrupts, if you want your buttons to generate interrupts when you press them or anything like that, uh, let me know. I'd be very happy to do a video on, on, on those topics and, and show you how those things work.